Okay, the next topic we're going to talk about is convolutional neural networks or CNNs. And this is what's used, commonly used these days, for classifying natural images or in images of any kind, but in particular natural images. And here's a palette of, of natural images. You've seen a hundred different images here. This is a data set that it's, it's known as a CIFAR 100, and the 100 stands for a hundred different image classes, right? So you can see there's fish, animals, butterflies, cars. So they're natural images and they fall into a hundred classes. So that's, that's a lot of classes. And each image is a 32 by 32 color image. Okay, so that's a little different to what we worked with before. And neural networks, when they re-emerged in, in 2010, their big success story was classifying images. They got spectacular results. And as a result of having these much larger training sets and much, much better computing power. For CIFAR 100, there's 50,000 training images and uh, 10,000 test images. Now, each image here is a three-dimensional array or feature map. So that means that it's got a red, green, and blue channel. So that's the third dimension. And the, the, the other two channels, the red, green, and blue channels, are, are images that are going to look like these, but they represent the three different colors. And each of the, those is going to be 32 by 32. This is just a little schematic that sort of gives intuition of our CNN's work. So what it does, here we've got a little cartoon image of a tiger. And the CNN builds up an image in a kind of hierarchical fashion. First, it tries to identify little shapes or or little color splotches or, or edges or so on in, the, in the, the image, but small, typically small. So you can see in this cartoon, it's picked up an ear, it's picked up part of the mouth maybe, there's a little bit of red, that's the tongue. So these are really small little localized parts of the image. And then if you go up the layers, these here are used as building blocks to build up more composite aspects of the images. They piece together to form more com complex uh, shapes, eventually assembling the target image. And this hierarchical construction is achieved using what's known as convolution and pooling layers. And that's where the name convolution is, where the CNN comes from, convolutional neural networks. Okay, so we're going to tell you about both of these uh, layers, the convolutional filter and the pooling layer. So here we're showing you, using little matrices, how a convolution filter works. So let's suppose your input image was this one, and we've re just represented the pixels as letters. And the convolution filter is itself a little image, and it's small. Here we've shown a convolution filter, which is just two by two. So it's just four numbers arranged in a two by two array. Okay. Now what we do is we take this two by two array and we move it on top of the left hand part of the image. So it sits up, uh, on top of these four numbers. And then we multiply the elements together and sum them up. So you can see that's what's happened over here. We multiplied them together and summed them <coughs> up. Right? So the A times the alpha, the B times the beta, and so on. Then we slide this filter along to the right, just one column, right? So they're overlapping, and we do it again. And so there you can see the, 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 what's known as a dot product between this little four by, two by two block and this filter. And then we do it, then we move down a row and we do it again. So now we use these four guys here, that's what's going on over here, and so on. So that operation is known as a convolution. You've got a filter, you've got the big image, and you do this convolution where you slide this, this little filter around the image and do these dot products. So the way it works is if the little sub-image over which we hover in the filter um, is similar to the filter, then that dot, dot product computes a, a large number. In other words, it's detected something that looks like itself in that place. Otherwise, it'll be a, a small number, the number will be low. Okay, so 
if this filter is any good, what it's going to do is, is it's going to make a new image and that image is going to highlight parts of the image where this little um, image was seen, basically, or, or close to being seen. And the other nice thing is that we don't supply these little filters. They learned when you learn the network, and we're going to have many of them. So here's an illustration. Target image is a tiger, and we've got two filters. Right? Let's pretend these filters were learned. And so these are two small little filters, and so you can see this one's got a vertical stripe with two black stripes and a vertical white stripe. This one's got a horizontal stripe. And we do the convolution over the image, they're going to look for vertical and horizontal stripes in the image. And it's not 100% clear, but you can see when we do the vertical stripe one, this image of the tiger tends to accentuate vertical stripes. And when we do the horizontal stripe one, it tends to accentuate the horizontal stripes. Again, not perfect, but it's, it's kind of doing the job. So the result of the convolution is, is a new feature map. So this image here consists of red, green, and blue channels. We just show in one fault here, but it's got red, green, and blue channels. But when you do the convolution, it produces a new image, right? Also what we call a feature map. So since images have three colors, it turns out these filters do uh, have, have as well. So the, you'll have a, a, a filter for the red, the filter for the green, and the filter for the blue. And then you do the dot product separately on the red, green, and blue, and then you add up the results. And so from one color image, you get one new feature map. Okay, so that's the convolution. And again, the weights in the filters are learned in the network. We'll tell you a bit more about that in a moment, but let me tell you um, also about pooling. So here's, here's, let's say, the feature map that we obtained from doing a convolution. What pooling does is, and, and this is called max pooling, it takes non-overlapping blocks, in this case, two by two blocks, which is what we actually use, and we replace each block by its maximum. Right? So here's the first two by two block. It's got one, two, three, and zero. The maximum value in there is three, so we put in a three. The next block is five, three, one, two. The maximum there is five, we put a five. And so on. And so you get a reduced image, which has got three, five, two, and four. So this sharpens the feature identification. If we thought of the convolution as, as highlighting areas where we saw a feature, by doing this pooling, we sharpen things and, and we allow a little bit of um, location invariance to where that feature is by picking the place where it's maximum. It also reduces the dimension by a factor of four. So in this case, a factor of two in each dimension. Okay, so here's the architecture of a, a CNN. So you'll see there's many convolve and pool layers. Here's the first convolve layer. And you can see we've got a number of feature maps here. The input image was 32. We come out with these feature maps are 32 by 32. Well, how come there's so many? Well, for each filter that we have, we get a new feature map. And so in this case, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Well, now we think of these new feature maps as new channels along this hierarchy. We had three color channels for the input. We've now create, created eight channels. Okay. We then do a, a pool, um, a max pool layer, and we, we, and I say the filters are typically small example three by three, right? Each, each filter creates a new channel in the convolution layer, and in this case, we see eight. As the pooling reduces the size, the number of filters channels is typically increased. Okay, so we had eight here. We, we still have eight here, but they've dropped in size to half the, the dimensions in each direction. And now we have filters that get applied to these guys. But now, the, remember, there's, we've seen eight channels here. So the filter has, have, has to have eight channels as well. Remember, we had three channels in the filter for the input. 
We've got eight channels here. Each filter has, has eight channels. One, one for each of these feature maps here. And because things are getting smaller in size, we have more filters. And so then the output becomes, we increase the number of feature maps that we produce. As what's happening here, we're going, we start on the left where the features are very local, very fine. And then as you pull and convolve, pull and convolve, you, the features are more and more coarse. Is that right? Yes. They're not as local as you move up? Yeah, that's right. Because that max pooling is allowing the feature to sort of move around and, and get localized and, and sort of zone in where it is. Because you could have two images of a tiger, and they, even though they've been standardized in some way, the mm -hmm. ear could be in different places for yeah. sure. And so this allows that kind of uh, location invariance. So it's almost like looking through the camera and the lens, you start very close and then you sort of pan back, right? Yes. So this carries on, right? We keep on going and we have a max pool layer. Then we have another convolve layer. Each time the max pool drops dimensions and the images get smaller and smaller. And we actually go all the way until we're down to some really small images like two by two. And then we just collapse what's known as flattening into the individual pixels in all those images. And we have a fully connected layer to the output layer where there's 100 classes. So that, that's how it works. And like we say, the number of layers can be very large. So there's a one network that was trained on, on a, a thousand class image database known as ImageNet. And it's got 50 layers. Right, so here you see in about eight layers, this one's got 50 layers, and we're gonna demonstrate it in, in a little while. In fact, we demonstrated it right now. So just to remind you, the parameters or the, the weights in, the, in these networks are the filters. And if we go back to our little um, filters here, you can see these four numbers here are weights that need to be learned. For a color image, we're going to have three channels. So there's going to be four times three is 12 weights for one filter. If you have many filters, the weights add up. Then when you go to these ones here, we got eight channels. So now each filter has eight channels. So the number of weights in each filter is eight times, say, we said three by three in, 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 for the a CNN. So they add up, right? So those, that's, where the, 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 that's where the parameters come in and they get learned during training. So there's ImageNet's one big image training database. There's even bigger ones today. And massive um, neural networks are trained on these, on these image databases and trained using distributed software by companies like Google and Facebook. And the nice thing is they make these pre-trained networks available. So here's a collection of photographs taken from um, a photograph album um, of natural images. And we're going to use a pre-trained ResNet uh, network to try and classify these images. And in the lab, we go through how we, we, we show you how to do that. But here, we're just going to show the result. And this procedure will, is going to produce probabilities for each of the 100 in this case, a thousand classes, but we're going to show the top three. And for the first one, it says gives 0.83 probability to a flamingo. And indeed, it was a flamingo. This guy is, a, is known as a Cooper's hawk. They're abundant in uh, Northern California. It calls it a kite, which is a kind of raptor. It gives 60% uh, probability to that. Second guess is a, a, is a great gray owl. Third guess with very small probability is, is a robin. That's way off. Here we zoom out of, of um, the Cooper's Hawk picture, and you can see it's sitting on a, a water fountain, and the network gets confused. So now it classifies this picture as a fountain and ignores the hawk. Mm -hmm. And then it seems to go off the, off the rails because the next guess is a hook, a nail, and then the next one's a hook. Here's a picture of a cute little dog. He's actually a lasso apso, which is a kind of um, Tibetan um, guard dog. It gets classified as a Tibetan terrier, and they look somewhat similar and with 56% probability. And then the second guess is a lasso, which is correct. And the third is a cocker spaniel. Here's a cat 
line in a, a curled up position. And this completely uh, fooled the network. I thought it was a, a old English sheepdog. Way down in the list is a Persian cat and slightly higher as a Shih Tzu uh, dog. And the last one, this is a Cape weaver bird in its nest. And it gets classified as a jacama, which is a, a, is a kind of bird that hangs out in trees and builds nests in trees. Its second and third guess are also birds. Can you go back to the picture of the CNN? I just was unclear about something. You say pre-trained. So when you apply this now to the, the photographs, which part is, is obtained from the database and, and, and which weights are, tra are trained for this data? Oh, I see. Yep. In, this, in this case, Rob, we, we took the network as is and just classified the images. Oh, so there's, there's no training at all? There's no training. I see. In this case, there's no training. Yep. But I think you're getting onto a, another point, which is interesting as well, Rob, um, about using pre-trained networks for other tasks. Right. So when you train an, a neural network on natural images, either, the, you know, the, let's say the ResNet one that we have here, um, a lot of the early layers of the network are just picking up features in, in natural images. And a lot of the training goes to learning those. Um, you may have a, a problem where you've got, say, medical images you know, of, of lungs or, or mammograms or something like that. And those pre-trained features can be helpful in in you know, in classifying or, or diagnosing medical images. So what you can do is you can, you can pick out those pre-trained layers from an image network, and then you can use some training data for the problem at hand to learn the remaining layers. And I guess the one is for mammograms, you might typically only have a few hundred training observations, but the pre-training might come from 100,000 images, right? Yes. So there's a lot more data for the pre-training. 